Today a demo of folding at home. Uh, not just it working, which is the end state that I'm showing you here, but how do you configure, how do you set it up in the first place? Now I'll point out that I've got 24 gig of RAM and uh, 16 CPUs assigned to this VM and it's actually doing work right now. And here's a remote management console on the same local subnet and it shows the uh, workload and a little bit of tuning you can do. Uh, even though it has this drop down menu about diseases, it says coronavirus right here. Um, so there's some discussion about if you're actually assigned coronavirus workload, COVID-19. Uh, not sure yet. Anyhow, let's get to it. So if we hit uh, stop folding here, There we go. Okay, so that killed it abruptly. All right, let's do a nice fresh start here and get going. So, vSphere client. All right, we've got the vSphere client going here and we got a little bit of a mess. Now, that was just a test to show things and to uh, do kind of a dry run. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that now. Keep things a little tidy. I've got my folding folder here. All right, and one little trick, if you don't want to type a goofy long name, just put in your clipboard by renaming. So now on my clipboard, I'm ready to create a new VM. Okay, so these are all done in this eight node, but a nice trick is I can pretend it's 16 nodes. Why? Because hyperthreading is turned on. So when I go to create the VM, you'll see I have the ability to deploy OVF template. And once I deploy this VM, I can change it to 16 CPUs. That's a nice thing because that might be what gets me assigned to COVID-19, at least 16 CPUs, um, 768 of RAM for each CPU. So, um, well, it's supposed to be something like eight gig of RAM. That doesn't seem to work if I give it 24 gig of RAM, it seems to um, be assigned a little more often. So a little unclear in the RAM thing too. All right, here it is. 101 came out today, earlier today. And I didn't install a video earlier, but unfortunately I got to replace it with this because of the remote management stuff. So if we go here, I'm gonna call this folding eight. It's on this host and folding at home version 101. But the host name is right there, folding eight. Okay, on the cluster, I'm gonna specify which node. These two are turned off because I wasn't having success getting those going. And the uh, 12 cores of the machine I'm on and doing videos and all that day-to-day -day work. So we're gonna do the eight core Xeon D 1541 here at the top of the list. Okay, a little summary screen there. I tend to go thin provisioned, especially when I'm on SSDs. I'm gonna leave it on that network. Okay, the easiest thing might here might be to follow along. When I say follow along, I mean, well, maybe bring up my article. Go to the configuration section, and now I can just kind of cut and paste things, right? Double click, cool. Uh, this was seven, eight, excuse me. So seven's already existing, right? Next, IP address, leave that blank, just falling down my list. Actually, DHCP will feed out the domain name too. So I could probably leave that blank, but this all, this DNS stuff obviously depends on your local network, how it's set up. Okay, let's get to the OS credentials. Put this in the clipboard. Paste that in twice. Moving along here. Let's go to remote networks. Now, I don't have a NVIDIA Grid GPU, and there's some discussion about GPUs that are compatible with the appliance version that William Lamb put on VMware Flings. So I'm gonna skip right over that and leave it at medium. We can actually change that later easily. This part is important though. Fully qualified domain name or IP address works colon 7396 and there's no HTTPS here. But you gotta type the syntax 
incorrectly, or you are not going to have luck with the client connecting. So by correctly, I mean syntax like this. So for my network, let's try that again. There we go. My network, 10.10.1.0 slash 24. That's the syntax. Now, you're more likely something like 182.168.0.0. So you want to end at that zero and then forward slash um, 24 for the network type. All right, let's move along. So this is remote networks to connective management, right? Password. Okay, that should still be in my clipboard. I'll make sure. Password to configure for remote management. Now, interestingly, I was not prompted for this password. Okay, so yeah, the importance of pasting the password there, hmm, <laughs> given my browser didn't even ask me and I was able to log right in and do remote management. Well, I can only do it from on subnet anyway, right? So I'm restricted to, if I'm on the network, I can get right into this URL here. That's it. So I'll need to alter these instructions a little bit to add remote management. Uh, team ID we can leave alone, the VMware, you can change it to whatever team you want. Let's move along and hit next. Okay, if you have browser-based credential management, you might get a pop-up. I said no. Here's my summary screen. Gonna hit finish. Now, it does not take very long to deploy this appliance. We can have a look if you're on Windows 10 or on a Mac, actually. You can do your monitoring of your system and have a look at the ethernet traffic and you'll see the bits going up over the wire. The OVA file is now going into the data store over on that remote server and creating this folding 8 VM. So I'm going to want to go ahead and change the properties of the VM before booting it for the first time. And then we'll go ahead and have a look at it through remote management. And that will wrap up this video, which the goal is under 10 minutes total. Um, so yeah, it's not a lot of work to set up folding at home on a per host basis. Now that you have a video like this to walk you through every little step, including the little things that might trip you up. And honestly, uh, I definitely got tripped up myself a little bit. Okay, so it's done creating it in under a minute. Change the properties, crank that thing up. It seems like uh, there's a new um, setting here. When you go 16 core or above, that's right in William Lamb's tweet from earlier today. And um, well, it talks a little bit about this big ADV. So that is a flag that's set automatically when this Photon OS Linux boots to take better advantage of larger VMs. Okay, you might remember um, my discussion about RAM. 12 is supposed to do the trick. I didn't find it did. So I go with say, 16 or even 24. I've got the RAM to spare, so that's fine. So I change CPU and RAM and that's it. Don't need to change anything else. Okay, let's launch the remote console so we can watch a boot for the first time. Bring that up on the screen that you're looking at. And power it up. Okay, Photon OS is booting. Okay. We're nearing the final setup stage of this video here. I'm going to bring up a browser tab. Um, so once that comes up, let me get a separate new browser session going here. I did have a little bit of trouble with Chrome. So I actually cut over to Firefox. Let's see what happens with this machine's IP address. All right, it's running. What's the IP address? Well, it'd be handy if it told you that, and it's not getting an IP address. It's not getting a workload assignment right now. Darn. Um, at the beginning of this video, you saw I had one. So that happens. Anyhow, here's my IP address, right? So I could actually put that in the clipboard if I want to be really lazy. And remember I said I'm going to bring up a browser? Let's bring up a browser. Okay. Now, do you remember what I said about the port number? That's okay if you don't. It's 7396. So before I hit enter, colon, 7396. No HTTPS, just HTTP but I want this to work for anyone's browser at any moment in time. So I'm gonna go ahead and explicitly type out the whole URL. Hit enter and we're in. 
excellent. So no problem with this Chrome instance. And it shows medium. That was the default during the install. You can move that slider. And um, well, that's now you see some of the difficulty in recording this video. I can't get it to consistently connect. But if you, back in the beginning of this video, it showed some information about COVID-19 and that some workload was actually happening. And uh, that's about it. I'd actually probably crank it to full if I actually get a workload assigned. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. That machine is doing absolutely nothing else. So it's dedicated to this project. And uh, hopefully, I'll get that to show up a little later tonight, uh, particularly in the overnight hours. I seem to have a little better odds. Um, I did see one person, maybe multiple, um, talking about rebooting the appliance if it's been booted for a long time. So if you don't get an assignment for many hours, I think it trails off on how often it tries. So to work around that, you could go ahead and manually reboot it. But obviously, you can be sleeping at night and whatever. And it seems to, I think it retries often enough. I don't quite know the algorithm. It looks like it's connecting. Cool. Nice. OK, something just happened. So what it's doing is taking Linux, giving me the tail end, the, the last part of a log file, and just echoing it on the screen here. So you can see 24 gig of RAM right here under my mouse there and 0 to 15 CPUs, so 16 CPUs. And no longer do we have errors at the bottom. Not quite familiar with what it's showing there. Um, darn, it failed again. OK, so still not there. Interesting that it's yellow instead of red. And you know, so if it succeeds, what we get is you know the CPU load moving over to the right. So I think this video is pretty complete now. Um, I have so many other projects and things I'm working on. This is a little rough around the edges, right? This video, I, I understand that. And I got a little wordy at points, but I kind of want to explain as I go along and kind of give you time to, you know, pause the video and, and, and catch up or, or follow along and just do this right alongside. So this video is coming out at 12 minutes, but the actual work itself, um, well under 10. So hopefully if nothing else, you're encouraged to go ahead and give this a try. And I'm leaving the rough edges, including some of the failure states based on the server. So that'll help anticipate some questions that are likely to happen on the YouTube video. Like, hey, Paul, I get a fail to connect. Um, now, this is different than workload not assigned, right? That server might be so darn swamped right now, it can't even connect to it. So let's wrap up. The OK, there it is. I was about to reboot, but it just got me the usual could not get an assignment message. So the server's hurting. <laughs> uh, we know this. My article acknowledges that. And that's why I've got this kind of header here in italics temporarily explaining there's stuff going on here, um, including some issues with handling so many people. OK, I was just working on editing the video. And I looked over at my other screen and saw some things are happening. So a few minutes after I stopped recording, OK, I moved the mouse over here. It's working. OK, and you can see it's an hour and 20 minutes till it's done. Let's have a look at vSphere monitoring of performance in real time. And there you can see the CPU went up at 24 after. So for four minutes, it's been cranking away at this workload. And it's using um, over 90% of my overall system resources. So that's, that's good. Um, and then RAM is trailing off, it looks like. All right, it's interesting. So this is what it looks like when it's working. And Notice I don't have it on only one idle. I cranked it over to full. How much of a difference that made? I don't know. But uh, this is good. You can even change the identity of the team you're contributing to at any time. So even though the OVA defaults to the VMware team 52737, you can change that right there. I want to point out that this particular cut of my video, this edit, did not include me looking at the VMware Appliance Folding at Home page uh, drop down list. So if you're an NVIDIA grid person, you're going to want to read those directions. But uh, everybody else here, deployment steps and FAQ. So go ahead and check those out. This video is not intended to replace those. It's intended to kind of supplement. So if you want to look at deployment steps, for instance, let me show you. Looks like this. And uh, yeah, Willing goes through most of what I just said. Some of these like hostname and IP, you're going to leave blank if you have DNS going. So mine's a slight twist on that. And he does talk a little bit about the remote management network and giving some examples. My video just kind of brings it to life in video form. But again, refer to the latest documentation there is my advice. 
can check out the FAQ as well, see if you find that useful. Go ahead and save that, and let's have a look at that together. Um, so yeah, that one I do remember seeing Friday night. I don't think that's changed since. Let's have a look. Okay, he's covering fail to get assignments, so that's good. And if you leave out root password, you're not going to get a GUI or you're going to get a login, so you know you've done it wrong. That's good. Okay, so it's not an option for COVID-19, but they will be prioritized. Um, and then he gives some numbers here. Hmm. Okay, how many CPUs? Try to give it 16. Goes over the big advance. This is great. So uh, he's got details here and a growing FAQ. Um, so you will probably find it helpful to review this. And again, you may be watching this video at a later time when something after 1.01 comes out. Okay, talking about VROPs, a little bit about firewalls. And can you change the config? Well, you can edit this file. Read about GPUs. And he's got some um, URLs here to check out. So you can see a performance there. Very nice. Now that's for the VMware team. Okay. Now this one, don't think I read that article. No, I did see this article too. This doesn't really get into specifics because really it doesn't tell you the exact uh, GPUs here. But more important, you're, this is a generic article for Linux, right? It's not like we have a uh, VMware VM section here. Kind of wish we did actually, but we don't at this time. So yeah, that's just supplemental information, but you're really gonna wanna check out the previously mentioned PDF for more details on NVIDIA Grid. That's what the appliance is ready for at this moment in time. Okay. And it's a few minutes later and I realized I did not show my power meter. So this is a power strip that has power port monitoring. So we've got a network switch at 12 watts and we've got 94 watts for the server. Not bad at all. That's a server with 64 gig of RAM and eight physical cores and an SSD on board. So its CPU is being taxed very heavily and you probably can guess what I wanna do next. Let's change this to light, see what happens here. And there you go. Okay, it briefly dipped down. What just happened? Huh, how about here? Can we see a difference? Well, it's not gonna be granular enough. Okay, that was a little weird. So 90, just a little under 94. Crank this to full. You can see it doing a parameter change over there on the left. Briefly settles down when there's no CPUs. And now I broke the whole workload thing. It ended up interrupting it. So don't do what I just did. <laughs> if you mess around with it too much. Um, It doesn't resume well. Oh well. There it comes. 98. All right, so the difference between light and heavy is only like four watts, maybe five. So it cleaned up. And now we're back to um, an hour and 11 minutes left. So that is it. And we're back down to 94 watts from 98. So I don't really see that playing with that slider does much. If you're trying to do this on a workstation that you're doing for other tasks, maybe going to light will make a difference, but it sure doesn't make much difference in watts um, or any difference really. So that's a wrap. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Thank you for watching and thank you for visiting Tinker Try. IT at home. Stay safe.